Our, light, our latest experiment involves parachutes. We want to study how the shape and the surface area of the chute affects how fast it falls back to Earth. So we're going skydiving? Sweet! Sorry, Dad, but jumping out of a perfectly good airplane is not what I had in mind. Dang. All of a sudden, this experiment turned into a real drag. Ugh, that was terrible. Anyway, we're going to make toys parachutes and then drop them off the slide at my school. Here's what we'll need. A plastic trash bag, a ruler, scissors, four identical washers to act as our skydivers, thread, twine, and of course, two army guys. He can't play with, the, with parachutes and not involve them. Just saying. Right. First, we settled on two different shapes for our chutes, mostly because they were easy to cut out squares and triangles. We also wanted to create two different sizes for each shape. Our experiment will be to study how the different sizes and shapes affects how fast the object falls. We began by cutting the plastic bag open and laid it out on the table. Then, using the ruler and a permanent marker, we drew two squares and two triangles onto the plastic. Now, we need to make sure the large square and the large triangle had the same surface area so we could compare their flight, er, falling, character, falling characteristics. To do that, we started with the square, mostly because it was easier to calculate the area. We made the large square 10 inches by 10 inches. To calculate the surface area of a square, you multiply its width by its height. For our larger square, that was 10 inches times 10 inches, or 100 square inches. For our small square, we used a width of 5 inches and the and height of 5 inches. That This gives us a surface area of 5 times 5, or 25 square inches. Next, we needed to make two triangles that would have the same surface area of these two squares. We started with the surface areas that we wanted to get to, 100 square inches and 25 square inches. Next, we had to look at how we calculate surface area of a triangle. We start by multiplying the width and height together, just like we did with the square, but then cut that number in half to find the area of the triangle. There are geometric proofs to show why this is, but we won't go into those right now. Now it gets a little trickier. Instead of starting with the dimensions and calculating the surface area, we have to work in reverse. We know the surface area we want to get to. We need the dimensions that will get us there. Let's start with the larger triangle. We want it to end up with a surface area of 100 square inches. The formula says that this is equal to 1 half times its width times its height. To solve for w and l, we use a little algebra to get rid of the 1 half by multiplying both sides of the equation by 2. Now, since we are t making this up as we go, we can just assign a value to one of these and then solve for the other one. If you take the square root of 1, 200, we get 14.14, so we use the measurement of 14 inches for the width, and then solve for the height, which turned out to be approximately 14.3 inches. Taking the square root allowed us to keep the two measurements close to each other, so we wouldn't end up with an overly fat or overly skinny triangle. We applied the same process to the smaller triangle and arrived at 7 inches for the width and 7.1 inches for the height. After we got the shapes drawn, it was time to get them cut out. And that wasn't quite as easy as it sounds. Dad held the plastic taut so I could cut it in reasonably straight lines. But with a little teamwork, Dad and I managed. Next, it was time to attach the thread to each corner of each shoe. We cut 14 lengths of thread about 12 to 15 inches each, and then started tying. Which was also not as easy as it sounds. The plastic was quite slippery, so the thread had a tendency to either slide off or not stay tightened down. Or both. Again, a little teamwork went a long way. Catherine put her finger on the knots so I, as, as I tied them so they would move while I tied the next one, so they wouldn't move as I tied the next one. Once we had all of the strings attached to a chute, we tied them onto the, onto the weight. Here's our first completed chute. As you can see, I had the clever idea of tying the chute to a baby star. 
as shown here, but it proved to be too bright, so we switched back to single washers. Dad, you goofball. Stellar joke, by the way. Oh, jeez, that was bad. Anyway, thanks to the wonderful world of editing, we can go poof, and magically, all four shoots are assembled. So after we got the official test shoots assembled, I made a couple more out of paper napkins and tied my army guys to them. Those would be just for fun. They're in the picture, but camouflaged, so you can't see them. And now, who's the goofball? With all of the shoots assembled, we headed out to the playground. We chose the tallest slide there because it allowed us to safely drop the shoots from a known height. For each test, I lined up the washer with the top of the bars. Before we got, before we got, before we started, we measured that height using the twine. I held on to the end and dropped the rest to Dad. He pulled it taut and cut it off right where it touched the ground. When we got back home, he measured it and found that from the top of the bars to the ground was 133 inches, or just over 11 feet high. Catherine dropped each shoot three times from that height. I ran the stopwatch and timed the drops. There was definitely room for error here, but we think we had, it is good enough to draw some u useful conclusions. All of the numbers shown here are in seconds. For the large square, we collected these times and then averaged them together. We repeated that process for the large triangle, the small square, and the small triangle. So what does this all mean? Well, first of all, notice that the average drop times for the large shapes are longer than for the smaller shapes. That seems to indicate that the larger surface areas lead to slower drops, and that jives with all our intuition. The larger the shoot, the slower you would drop. What's not clear from this data is whether the square shapes or the triangular shapes made any difference in the speed of the drop. For the larger drop, the square led to a slower drop, but the opposite was true for the smaller shoots. That might be due to the margin of error we had in our measurement process. It, also, it might also say that once the size of the shoot reaches some threshold, there just isn't any real difference in the drop speeds, but perhaps if we were to make even larger shoots, we'd notice more of a difference. How do the Army's guys do? Well, we never measured their drops, but it was by far slower than the official ones. That was probably due to a couple of reasons. The paper napkin shoots were larger, and the Army guys weighed far less than the washers we were experimenting with. Huh. Did any of them go AWOL? What's AWOL? It stands for absent without leave. Um, Dad, they're plastic toys. You can't give them leave to begin with. Uh, it's an expression. I meant, did you lose them in the drops? Oh, sorry. No, I made sure I got them both back. I didn't want them to feel like they were lost. Didn't you just say they were plastic toys? Now they have feelings? Well, yeah. Didn't you see that Pixar movie?